Right. Um, so you are welcome once again to uh, our third class. It has been it has been very great so far, and then so I would like to congratulate all of us up to this point. Um, so for today's class, we are basically going to do something a little bit more advanced than the previous ones we did. So once again, my name is Clement. Um, I'm a PhD student from Cardiff University. Um, I study mathematics. And this particular program is was organized by Nuxa China. Um, so it's all about advanced data analysis into R. Okay, so one thing we have to notice that is everything we are learning is just the basics and you can get further um, examples and practice tasks um, on my on my YouTube um, YouTube channel. So don't forget to to uh, make advantage of um, take advantage of that. And then you can also get access to all files on Piazza. So for Piazza, too, don't forget to also join. All right. So without wasting time, I'll just share my screen and keep in mind that everything will be also recorded and you'll get access to all the information after Saturday. All right. So I'll share my screen without wasting time. Okay. All right. So um, today is the third session. I will speed up a little bit because you'll be able to watch the YouTube video and then practice at your own pace. Um, so most of the examples we are going, going to consider, um, there might be advanced versions of them already on my YouTube channel. And there are some examples that I've not also tackled on my YouTube channel. So you can also benefit from this one as well. All right, so today, what are we going to learn? So we are going to learn something about creating functions and a bit of data visualization, or let's say, um, introduction to data analysis. So why, why do we need to create our own function? Keep in mind already there's an, there are inbuilt functions for most of the things you wish to do in R. So it, it, when it comes to fitting a model, maybe you want to do a regression, maybe you want to do time series analysis, you want to maybe find some um, summary statistics, there are inbuilt functions for them, okay? And there are instances where some functions might not be inbuilt. Inbuilt functions implies that you don't need a package in order to be able to run those functions, okay? So that's the, the, the difference between inbuilt functions and using other packages. For packages, what they imply is that someone has written his own function, his or her own function, and then has wrapped it up in a package so that when you install and load the package, you'll be able to have access to all the functions that he created. So that's the, that's the difference with using a package and then the inbuilt function. So, so try and get this distinction very well. All right, so why do we need to create functions? Depending on the research, your research problem, a time is coming where you, you might not be able to get access to some specific functions in R to be able to do your task for you. And there are even instances you want to automate your own codes, create your own functions to do something more complex, which might not even be, which might not even be in the R software. So, so that's the whole goal. And if you're able to create your own function, what it implies is that sometimes it helps you with your, with your learning and also with your research. So for instance, you pick an article and you see a very complicated function in there. And then they, they, they generated some plots and other things. And you ask yourself, how would you be able to, to do the same thing? So that is why you need to be able to create your own functions to be able to do such tasks. Okay, so by the end of today's lesson, you should be able to create your own function given any formula. So if I give you any formula, any formula, the formula can be complicated. It can have even integrals. It can have different, it, it could be as complicated as possible. You should be able to create your own functions. And one thing I wanted to tell, maybe I didn't say in the previous two meetings, is that the internet is your friend. So everything we are doing, once you're able to import data into any programming software, and you know how to install a data, I mean, uh, install a, a package, and then you know how to set a working directory and import data from your working directory. Technically, you don't necessarily need anyone to teach you how to do data analysis because at that point, once you're able to import data into R, the rest is just using the internet, okay? But th that is not good programming practice. You should be able to do a lot of things on your own, but, uh, but keep in mind that you are not supposed to, you are not, no one is an island. So technically, once you're able to import a data, and suppose, let's say you want to fit a regression model, just go online, type how to fit, let's say, a generalized linear mix model in R. 
And then in that case, when you go online, you see the blog and you see that the first thing was that they were loading some packages. They use library of something. Already, you know that anytime you see library of something, that thing in there is a package and you know how to install your package. So it, it implies anytime you go on to the internet and you see library of something, they are all packages you need to be uh, you need to install in order to be able to what, have access to or to be able to run all the codes uh, um, um, that they created online. Okay, so keep that in mind. And yeah, so once you're able to import data, set your own working directory, I think at that stage, make good use of the internet. So for those who have never used R before, suppose you were used to um, Stata and then you were doing maybe time series analysis in Stata, maybe you were fitting Arima models in Stata. Or maybe you were, um, yeah, maybe you were fitting Arima models in Stata. Now you should be able to import your Stata data into R. We've learned how to import any data structure, whether it's coming from a different software or not. We know how to import it. Fine. Now after importing, all you need to do is just type how to what, how to do time series analysis in in R. Okay, or to fit Arima model in R. Suppose that's your question. I mean, that's what you wanted to do. And at that point, you will be able, you should be able, and you should be familiar with some of the codes when you go online. Okay, so that's the whole essence of what we are doing here. So what we are doing is just to give you the, a, a very good background so that you'll be independent researchers and you should be able to do some um, statistical analysis without any effort. Keep in mind, if you're able to watch everything we are doing for this four day period, and then you're also able to watch everything on the YouTube videos, practice things on the Piazza. The Piazza. Technically, you'll be an expert, so keep that in mind. All right, so today's session, um, we are going to create a function. Um, so we'll start with how to create simple functions in terms of the, the building blocks, and then we'll talk about the syntax. And then we'll look at adding extra complexity to the functions, okay? Um, and then, and keep in mind, functions can be created to be so complicated as much as possible. It depends on what you want. So it always depends on what you want to do. I, I personally usually don't want to be doing things one at a time. I want to be doing things automated. So I want to automate my encodes in such a way that it produces a lot of things within the shortest possible time for me. Um, so don't be doing, uh, or don't, don't try to be, maybe for, for instance, if you have a data with, uh, let's say, 17 variables. You don't need to be finding the summary statistics for each of them separately. You can actually do everything together at once, okay? So that's actually the essence of creating your own functions to get what you want. What you want might not be there. You might get substitutes in R to be able to do those things for you. However, you have the ability to create what you want. So keep that in mind. And then um, we'll look at that complex um, summary statistic functions that, that I said. So with that summary statistic function, it's a function that I have created myself. So it's a novel function, no one has created it. I'm going to run, write a package around it as in wrap it up with a package. So no one should, no one should write a package with it because it's, it's mine and then there's there's already um, copyright issues with it as well yeah so one thing i just want you to notice that with that summary statistics function you can use it for all your research works okay you can use it for anything you want to do all it does is for any data when it picks that data it asks whether it asks each variable whether you are numeric or not if you are numerical in in, in terms of if the variable is numerical it computes the mean median skewness ketosis mode um, as as meant, I, I think, and the maximum, minimum, and all sort of things. And then it plots histogram for you and choose a different color for it. If it is categorical, and keep in mind that you don't have to tell it whether it's categor categorical or not. I've created a function in such a way that it will ask and determine whether it's categorical or not. But before you use the function, you should have already declared which variables are categorical and which variables are not. So suppose maybe you had a variable called gender. And gender, you coded it as one and two, I mean, a dummy variable. I told you when you import, R will not know that one and two represent a categorical variable, gender, right? So all you need to do is to be able to now declare that when you see one, it implies male, when you see two, it implies females, using that factor function. Once you're able to do that, now at that stage, my function will be able to determine all the categorical variables and all the uh, numerical variables and do the summary statistics. If it is categorical, it, it finds the percentages for you. And I, I made it in such a way that it, it even runs it to two decimal place for you. And then it plots pie chart for you and choose different colors. If there are 17 categories, it will choose 17 different colors. So I've made it 
in a, in a more automated way and we'll, we'll look at how to use that function for your own research works. And the last thing is um, doing correlation analysis. There are inbuilt functions in R that doesn't need a package that you can use to obtain um, informative correlation matrix plots, especially when you want to look at like um, the bivariate relations or pairwise relationship between some variables, okay? But there's a package called per performance analytics and it actually gives you a very powerful information cor uh, correlation information plot which I think to do any um, regression analysis, that could be the first thing you could use to explore your data. And I mean, the graph is, is super nice. So we'll also do that. And so let's just go straight to today's um, session. So how do we create functions? So this is the basic syntax. So always, now we all know what an object is. So you just give your function, the object name to the function. So the name can be anything, but make sure you don't space it. You can replace the the underscore with a dot okay and then keep in mind that you cannot use a number to start your object so for instance i cannot use one i cannot put one in front of the function underscore name um I, so keep in mind that you cannot start an object's name with a number but it i mean after the first position it can be anywhere anyway fine so what this is how we create a function the first thing is you have to write um, I mean the function name. Then you write function in bracket. So in the, in in bracket, these are the arguments you are going to specify. These arguments, you can have arguments where uh, one is um, picking a data frame, one is picking, let's say, a vector. You can have as many arguments as you want. It could be a constant. It could be anything you want. So keep in mind that the arguments could be more than one. It could be it could be over ten arguments. It depends on however or whatever you want to do. Okay, and then and then you open your curly brackets. Okay, so keep in mind you just type function, then you specify your argument. We will learn how to do that. And then um, the next thing is you can indicate any number of um, tasks you want to perform. And keep in mind that a function can return more than one output at a time. So if you are interested in let's say um, computing just the mean, okay, creating your own function to find the mean, okay, in that case it means you are only going to return one thing. But suppose you want to create your own function to return, like my complicated function, it returns when when it determines its numeric uh, numerical in nature, it, it it returns the mean, the median, the, the mode, the skewness, ketosis, minimum, maximum. Um, yeah, and then it also returns plots as well. So just imagine that I could actually return a plot inside a function. So you can actually create a function to return a data frame, to return a lot of things. Okay, so keep in mind. This is the basic syntax for functions. You just type function, open your, your, your run bracket, specify as many arguments you want, and then and then you can indicate any operations you want to actually what actually implement as many as you want. And then always there's this thing called return. So the return is useful. I'll show you the instances you can actually ignore. You can ignore it, but you Suppose I have several operations here. You, I can choose to return any of them, okay? Or I can choose to return all of them. So the return is used to actually bring out or return the, the, the let's say, the whatever operation you are interested in or the results you are interested in, okay? So keep that in mind. So that's why I made this disclaimer that a function can take as many arguments as you wish and it can return as many outputs as you want, okay? Fine. So... We are going to start with simple a simple function and then it becomes complicated over time so now let's suppose you wanted to find the mean okay so we are starting with something very basic it's going to get complicated over time so don't worry so let's suppose you want to find the mean and then suppose you didn't even know what the mean was as in you didn't know how to compute the mean keep in mind there's an inbuilt function to find the mean which is just mean okay it finds the mean of a, of a variable fine Suppose you see this formula and you, and you are expected to create a, your own mean function, okay, to find the mean. How would you have gone uh, approach this? Keep in mind that when you are typing, let's say, um, creating a function for formulas, just type them the same way you are seeing it. So you realize that here is saying that it's one divided by n. We know n is the length of the, of the data or the sample size. And here is saying some all the elements of x. Okay, fine. So to, to actually create our own function, first of all, 
um, create our own data so that when we are done with creating the data, we'll be able to now implement um, our function based on that data. So here, I'm just simulating 500 normal um, um, random samples, okay, with mean um, 300 and standard deviation 50, okay? So I'm sure by now we all know how to simulate probability distributions. If you don't know, um, I've already done that or covered that in my other YouTube videos. And if you watch, I think the first two lessons we, we did something like that. Fine. So I'm going to show you um, four ways of creating this same mean function and then and then point out certain things you need to know. Okay. So here I just gave any object name that I want. So I'm saying mine.mean and I brought one. You see, I told you I cannot bring one in front, but I can put a number anywhere after the first position. And then I wrote function and then we have x. So keep in mind, in this case, I have only one argument. If I, I want to add extra argument, I'll bring a comma and add the extra argument. So suppose I wanted to bring extra argument, let's say y, z, whatever. I'll just bring x, comma, y, comma, that. Keep that in mind. So at this stage, I have only one argument. And then I want to, because keep in mind, I'm trying to what? Replicate or produce this formula, right? So I need to extract n. So n is just the length of the data. We know how to find the length of the data with just this formula. And keep in mind, when you are specifying the, the function, don't specify it based on the data itself. Specify it using any variable so that you can be able to reuse it for any other thing. Okay, so keep in mind, if I should, because I've already created a, a data, I mean, the data is called data. I don't need to specify data as, as an argument. I want to use X so that when I'm done, I can just say X is equal to data. That means that I'm specifying my argument for x as the data and then it will it will do it for me so that if you are given a different data set it should be able to still implement it for you okay fine so keep that in mind always use something arbitrary when you are creating your functions so here i'm returning the, the the number of observations and here just see um this is the sum of x i just typed sum of x i don't need to worry about i from one to n keep in mind when you are summing your element of a vector from one one to let's say n just type in some around x is doing the same thing for you okay and divided by n so that is exactly what i did so this is how simple you can create your own function and then here i'm returning the mean value okay which is this formula so at the end of the day once i now specify my argument as data it produces my output for me okay so at the moment i have the that i have the mean and then this is the inbuilt mean function and that also gives us the same answer now, one thing you have to note is that, let me come to the method two. So you realize that in the method two, I didn't bring, after typing the mean, I didn't bring return, but I just type, I just um, um, copied and pasted the object name here. And it still produced the output that I want, okay? So keep in mind that in R, if you don't specify return, okay, but you were able to put your last object name at the last bit of your function, it, R automatically assume that that is what you want to return. But keep in mind, suppose I forgot to um, 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 copy and paste, let's say, what I wanted to return, and I didn't also type return. If I should run this, it won't give me anything. Even though it has computed the mean inside the function. Now, keep in mind, this is what I meant by local, local environment. All the variables, so, keep, um, so if you look at N, N is an object, right? At this stage, since n is within this function, we call it a local variable. A variable like, let's say, data, I created it outside, or the object data, I created it outside a certain function. So this data corresponds to some of my global variables. So know the difference between, and know the difference between global variable and local variables, okay? So, so the global variables are the variables you create outside some function. And once you create some specific variables or let's say objects inside your function, those are what we call local variables. So you should be able to also understand local environment and global environment is the same kind of ideology. Fine. So here, so just keep in mind that I can choose to just um, um, put the object that I want to return at the last bit of the code without necessarily what bring and return and it also do the same job for me. Fine. And keep in mind in R, you can actually um so you realize i was separating i bring i write this and come to the next line um you can technically write everything on the same line if you want but the only difference is that um let me take these 
these comments of if you want to do it that way i'm talking about so so for instance you can bring this one here and separate use a semi i suppose it's a semicolon yeah use a semicolon so when you use a semicolon you can actually type functions on the same on the same line keep that in mind if you are using matlab for matlab if you if i should even create let's say um the function the, the variable um, or the object n which is the length if i don't bring a semicolon it will print it out automatically and sometimes it makes your code very um clumsy in a way so just keep in mind that in r we don't have that problem but to write a line of code on the same line you just have to separate it by semicolon anyway fine and this will still do the same job for you fine um but i suppose if i should bring this one as part of the line oh it also does the same job okay fine that's fine all right so let's let's continue now here i i i i, I chose not to bring the mean num uh, the mean value and chose not to bring return and like i said it won't produce anything fine and um and another thing i was doing was that keep in mind you don't necessarily have to create separate object i mean separate objects for each of the things you can actually just type sum of x divided by length of x and that would also do the mean for you because you know the mean is just sum of s divided by the length of s was literally your n but when you do it this way, I mean this way, you kind of um, make, because there, 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 there's a time coming where you'll be creating a complicated function and then you would want to be able to comment it. And if you realize, I try to comment my course so that when I give it to you, you know that, oh, this line of code was trying to find the number of elements in the, in the vector. Okay, this line of code was trying to find, um, was trying to compete me. At, at time is coming, you're doing something very complicated. And if you are not able to write your comment, you might forget what that function was trying to achieve. So just keep that in mind that it's a good programming practice to comment your codes, okay? So just keep that in mind. And here, you realize that I, I specify my argument, but I just typed this um, sum of s divided by that. I didn't bring return because that is the last line of code. And I didn't save it in an object, so it would totally print it out for me. But suppose I save this in an object, let's say a, and I didn't bring return a, or I didn't even type, I didn't even type A here and I run, I'll not get any output. If I put A here, I'll get an output. If I type return, return A, I also get an output. Okay. So let's go on. So now the next thing is you want to start getting comp I mean, we want to make the functions now complicated. Suppose now you want to create your own functions to compute the variance and the standard deviation. Now I have two formulas. I, you should be able to create the, the variance and the standard deviation based on the two formulas. So we are going to create for the first formula and then we create for the second formula. All right. So now with the first formula, so like I said, when you are creating your functions in R, just type it or just code it the same way you are reading the code. I mean, you are reading the formula. If you look at this formula, you realize that it's first of all, consider each X minus the mean and square it before it sums and divide everything by N minus one. And this one, which is the standard deviation, is just the square root of this. So technically, once you create this, the variance, you don't need to create a separate formula for the standard deviation. Just type, just find square root of the variance and you should be fine. All right. So here, I'm going to type it the same way the function has been presented. So that's how easy you can create your own functions. Okay. Now, now um, so the first thing in the function, we need to find the mean. So all I, I did was, or, and we need to know our sample size, right? So I just... I just considered n equals, so don't forget the, sum, the function I'm calling is summary underscore func1. And then I type function and then I open my brackets and I have only one argument. So since I have only one argument, if I should put any extra argument, I'll get an error because it says that it's an unused argument, as you can see. All right. So keep in mind that always the you cannot add argument that you didn't actually add earlier okay fine so so here the s bar is computing the mean and you realize that the mean i'm not using the inbuilt function mean i could have just typed the inbuilt function mean but i'm using our own previous uh, previously created mean function called mine dot mean one because now it does the same job as using the inbuilt function mean okay so this is the beauty about creating your own functions but I don't think it's advisable to create your own functions if there are already inbuilt functions to implement that for you. But there, are, I mean, there will be a lot of instances where what you want to do or the formulas you are trying to implement will not be 
will not will not have it in inbuilt functions or sometimes you might have to download a package i i, I think that's not a good uh, programming practice you should be able to create your own functions to do these things for you fine and the next one was i'm trying to find a variance so look at this is the formula i'm trying to create so all i needed to do was to consider x minus the mean so if you look here this is x minus s bar the s bar was the mean and then i'm squaring in r we use this to square let's say let me open this one so to square let's say two i just need to use this and that is how to square and to multiply we use that and that is what so when you see a function let's say 2x suppose x is um x is five Suppose x is 5. Look at what happens. We are going to get an error. And the reason is because even though when you are writing a function, you could have written it like 2x. In R, you have to know that the 2 is multiplying x. So you have to bring the times, which is the asterisk sign, before it would actually work. Okay, so keep that in mind. That don't, even though you see a function as 2x somewhere, always make sure that you bring the multiplication because you are multiplying. All right. So let's continue. Fine. So, um, yeah, so this one is basically computing the, the, so what I did was I subtract each X minus X bar and then I square it. And then I, I sum that and divide by N minus one. It's just a simple thing for that. So someone will see this and think, oh, this is complicated, but clearly it's simple. And then to find the, the sigma, okay, or which is the standard deviation, it's just the square root in R. Square root is type. So suppose I want to type square root of four. We use SKR, SKRT of four, okay? So that is the, um, what we use to type square root. So I just use square root around the previous, the, the, the variance that I've already computed, okay? So now, I've computed three, um, three things. I know the mean, I know the, 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 the variance, and I know the standard deviation. Now, to return it, I can return it in so many ways. This line of code is returning it as a list. Keep in mind that if you want to return more than one thing at a time, you can either return them as a list. The list is one of the most effective ways. You can also return it. So now, I just type list in bracket, and I give any name I want to give to. Here, I've used mean. I could have typed mean value. And you realize that it will reflect here. Okay, I could have used any name for it. I could have used any name for this one um, value and it will pop up there. Okay, so fine. All right, so that is how you, you can read. So here you just put any name you want. And then here, if it's the mean, you bring the mean, the variance, and then the standard deviation. I can also return it as a data frame. In that case, you have to um, remove the comment here. So for a data frame, re just replace this list by data.frame. Now see, it, you kind of get the output in this form. It's also a, a fancy way. But the beauty about the list is that, you see, for a data frame, suppose each output, keep in mind this one, is because the mean is just a constant, the variance is just a constant, and the standard deviation is just a constant. There are instances where what you want to return, some are data frame, some are vectors. Okay, so you get it. So when it happens that way, okay. So for instance, suppose I want to add another, let's say data, um, um, let's say um, data data frame, let's say data frame one. Okay, all right then. So I'll just um, consider, let me just copy, let me just copy this one and paste here. All right. So meaning that this is also another thing I'm trying to produce and I want to retain this one. Now see what happens. If I should just type, uh, let's say DF equals this. If I should run this one, um, you, um, it has produced, let's say the, the, the first three was the standard deviation and the standard deviation, the variance and that. And it has produced, it has added the other ones, different dot mean, different dot that's fine. But there are instances where, because this is still just a constant, there are instances where the vector could be, the data could be like a data with about 20, uh, let's say 50 rows and let's say 10 columns. When it happens that way, you it will not be able to do that for you. Okay, because keep in mind, this one is because they are having, they are both, they are all constant. That's why it's happening that way. But as a list, if I was using a list, I can just um, copy this one. If I'm using a list, I can just put this one there, all right? And I get it in this form, 
And for the, the beauty about the list is that now if I come here, suppose I want to extract, I want to extract just the results for um for the data frame. I just copied the dollar. I told you we use the dollar sign for extraction. This time around, I'm saving it in an object. I told you you always use an object if you want to use it at a later time. All right. So now I've been able to extract just the data frame bits of it. Suppose I want to extract just the mean. I just copy the mean and then I put it here and then it extracts just the mean. So that's the beauty of the list. Okay. So keep that in mind. Now let's go on. So we so the previous one we created it based on the first the first based on the first formula for the um, mean and variance um, for the variance and the standard deviation. Now if we are using the second formula. You see, the second formula is also a decomposed version of the previous one. They are the same, but it looks a bit complicated. Creating it still shouldn't be a problem. This implies summation S square. So here, I'm just using summation S square and then minus sum everything square before you divide by N. So here, you realize that I'm summing the sum around X sums everything, then I'm squaring and I'm dividing by N. And here is all divided by n minus one. So you realize that I brought a bracket around, around this part just to indicate that that's the numerator. And I'm dividing by n minus one. So here, be careful of board mass. Okay. Technically, if we say divided by n minus one, the function might consider this part first without the minus one. So just to be safe, you know that the n minus one is a single number just bring brackets to to make your life easier okay fine so here i'll just return it as a as a data frame instead fine so keep in mind you can return it as a data frame and the beauty about the list is that you could have some of your output could be just constant some could be a data some could be plots so i could have also returned a plot as well okay and we'll, we'll find that very soon now this is a practice task i'm giving you um, so you can practice on your own. So you are going to create your own function to find based on the, the experience you've had from just these few lessons, you should be able to do this one on your own. So create a function to form um, to calculate the Pearson correlation between two var uh, um, variables, x, uh, um, x and y, and compare it with the inbuilt correlation function. So, so keep in mind, um, so suppose I create a, a vector, let's say, um, one, two, let me use um, a, a, a simulation. So let's say R norm of 100 and let's say Y is, let's say RSO of 100. So this, in this case, I've simulated a normal, the 100 normal samples and 100 exponential samples. To find a correlation between them, we use COR and then that gives me the correlation between them. Okay, fine. Now I want you to use your own inbuilt function okay to find a correlation so this these are the specific task and um so the first the specific task is so this is the formula you are going to create it should be simple trust me it's, it's just use the idea that we just learned um so creating this one in r i'll just consider sum x y and then multiply by n minus it's just the way you would have read this one type it the same way and it should be fine now the first thing is create your own function to find the uh, to find the um, to return the piercing correlation as well as the coefficient of determination, which is just the square of the piercing correlation. So I just want you to create your own function that will return both the the piercing correlation and the coefficient of determination. You don't necessarily need to do regression before you can get coefficient of determination. Coefficient of determination is basically the square of your correlation. All right, so just keep that in mind. And then, and then obtain 800 exponentially distributed um, simulated samples with rate 50, okay? So here, with rate 50, I would have put rate equals 50, and that is going to obtain that kind of exponential, okay? And then since 800, you, you specify 800 there, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, all right, if I don't specify anything there in, in R, it assumes that the rate is one for exponential for norm, run, run, normal variables or uh, normal distri um, distributed variables. If I don't specify anything that the mean and the standard deviation, it assumes it's a standard normal with mean being zero and uh, standard deviation equal to one. Okay, so so keep that in mind. Fine. So that is the first. So obtain um, this data, call it object X, and then set a seed. Okay. The reason why you should set a C so that we will all get the same results if you implement yours. And then the next thing is obtain 800 normally distributed random samples with mean 50 and then standard deviation 10. So in that case, 
you just have to specify mean equals 50 and standard deviation equals 10 and it's 800 then you just put 800 so here suppose i just use okay um, i've basically I've basically i it for you but anyway but keep in mind i told you to set a seed so if we set a seed you are going to get the same answer at this stage if i run i'll get a different answer because i'm not setting a seed and this is a random generator okay so keep that in mind fine so you set a seed so that we will all get something constant similar and then people can reproduce your results fine so the next thing is after obtaining these two um, data sets find a piercing correlation and also find its um, co coefficient of determination so in your function it should return these two things you can return them as a list i don't mind you can return it as um as a data frame i don't mind so keep that in mind you don't need to submit this to me just practice if if you have any queries you can always shout okay fine now the next the another practice test i want you to do based on just what you've learned you should be able to do this as well so if you if you recall those of us who studied commas i'm sure everyone did commas at a point in their life especially in ghana at a point we're made to memorize the structure let's say the curve of s square the curve of s cube even the curve of one over x and so on and so forth so suppose um this is also another task I want you to do. You are going to generate, um, you are going to generate 100, um, 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 generate, let me take this, generate 100 numbers between 1 to 1,000. Um, I wrote 10,000 anyway. It's fine. Okay, fine. Still 10,000. Between 1 to 10,000. But I want you to generate 100 numbers. So if you remember, I told you you can bring sequence 1 to 10,000, length dot out, because 100 would produce just 100 for you. Okay, so um that is it fine so just to show you one way so that you do everything yourself keep in mind when you're plotting i want a combined plot and yesterday i showed you how to do a combined plot using the par mf row um fine so don't forget that anyway so suppose i want to look at the the i let me so i'm literally doing the task for you but i'm not going to do it for, i'm just doing few i'm using a different example so suppose i've generated um the kind of sequence I was talking about let's say i've generated this sequence now suppose i want to look at different um let's say f i won't i won't evaluate f1 suppose um so technically i could have created a function called f1 and then use fun and um, function use function and then and then return or and then return let's say um let's say if it's one over x i want to find i want to use a different example keep in mind if it's just a, a single thing you want to return you can actually ignore the curly brackets and you can even ignore return and use it this way yesterday i demonstrated that with a for loop for you and um, so with this one it implies that um if i want to call this function i just have to specify the argument is let me use a different variable for this so now i'm putting y here and where, 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 where. oh sorry this one okay fine so here it has produced the the, the the data for me so here you can just plot okay you can just do your the plot and um, that i was asking for so for instance type type equals l and let's see what happens and um, let me set the color um we shouldn't waste time because we have other things to do um so Fine. Um, fine. So I have this. This is the kind of output that I had. Um, so that is trying to say that this is the shape of one over x. Okay, this is the shape. If it is minus one over x, I just have to put minus here and see what happens. This is minus one over x. Okay. So yeah. So so it meant with this, it makes learning mathematics very easier. However, when you are creating such a function, you can actually choose to create it. So let me use, um, um, let me type par mf row equals, let's say, two by one. The last time I set the margin, the margin is if you want to make it wider, but that's fine. Well, now I'm not set anything. I could have also just typed um, plots. Uh, in, in, in this case, plots let's say um but let's say i could have just typed y square 
Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I wanted to return one divided by x. So let's stick to one divided by x. So here, in this case, it's one divided by y because the data is y. Fine. But I told you the argument can be, be anything. But your data can be anything. It can still be x. It won't change anything. It can still be x. Everything will be fine. Now, you realize that, okay, this one, I didn't bring the type equals that. So the type equals L is if you want to get a line graph, okay? Um, yeah, so here we are getting the same results, okay? So keep in mind that I didn't create any function. Once I generated a sequence of, a sequence of, let me put X here. Once I generated a sequence of X, okay? I just have to type one over X. If it is S square I want to produce, I just have to, I, I just have to do this. I need to produce a sequence of S square for me. This is a, a graph of, this is the graph of S square. Suppose I want to add extra complication, three times x. It will do that for you. So this is like um, um, a quadratic function, x squared plus three x. And that is it, okay? So so keep in mind, you can add. Now the type, if I change the type to, to be s, I kind of get this plot. I mean, I, I can't, let me, let me now use a different, um, say an actual simulated data for us to get some of the graphs well. So, so for instance, if I use X, let me set a seed. Set the seed. Let's say any seed number, fine. So now this is the, the kind of plot I had. I was trying to simulate a normal a, a normal distributed data. Fine. So here, if I, I set, I use um let me just use one plot so that we'll get what I want. So if I use L, this is what I get. I get a line graph, okay. Um, let me use, let me use exponential. Okay, fine. So I get that kind of plot. If I choose this, this one to be P, it only points like a scatter kind of plot. Okay, so keep that in mind. If I choose this one to be H, this is what I get. Okay. If I choose, you won't see difference because of the nature of the data. So keep in mind the plot type indicates the kind of, if you want those survival cases, those of you who have, I mean, those into statistics, especially those into survival analysis. If I should put S here, it kind of does a stepwise kind of thing for, for us, but it's because of the nature of this data. All right. So let's just ignore and go on. So keep in mind this practice task is easy. You can either create your own functions for each of them and then plot them together okay so don't don't forget that and um, this is a normal and uh, this is the the density function of a, no, a, a normal random variable with some specific mean and and, and standard deviation you so you should be able to create your own function and plot this graph okay so so keep that in mind i want i want you to do a combined plot so since it's a four different functions you can actually do set here to be um, um two by two okay so so for instance, if I should, if I should just consider this and let's stick to, let's stick to L. Right. So in that case, you have the, the four plot and so on, and then you can have the other ones, other ones popping up here. Don't forget you can label your X as is. We said we use X lib, use X lib. We don't have time, X lib um, to label your x axis, and then we use y lib to label our y axis. Okay, fine. Since I didn't put anything there, it implies it takes all the labels out and it takes everything off. But if I put anything there, let's say, let's say, um, um, sample or something, it goes into your the, the y the y axis. Bit. Okay, so fine. So keep that in mind. Um, let's continue. So now we want to do some data visualization, and this is where we are going to get more complicated. Um, so now we are importing a data, this meta ray data. We've already been seeing it um, since yesterday. Now I'm going to add a new variable called income level. Okay, and the income level it is already um, numerical. I just want you to note that there are instances where, for instance, you have body mass index, and you want to recategorize the body mass index such that if an individual's body mass index is less than, let's say, 18, 18.5, then the individual is said to be underweight. If it is between 18 to, let's say, 24, then you say the individual is normal weight. If it is greater than that, maybe overweight and so on and so forth. 
So those, so keep in mind, you can always what recategorize and 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 numeric variable into categorical variables. So here I'm just I'm trying to demonstrate that to you so that in future when you're giving a data set, you should be able to. I mean, when you're analyzing your own data, you should be able to do all these things. Keep in mind, we have already covered these things extensively on YouTube. So this is just to expose you and you can further get uh, extra information going on to my YouTube channel. Fine. So here we are going to create, um, and so the income level is a variable that is not part of the data. We are adding it as a new variable. And then um, we are computing in such a way that when the, the income, income as a variable is less than 1.5, it should consider it as um, 1.5 in thousands. It should consider it as low level if it is between um, um, 1.5 and 2. It should consider it's medium and then when it's greater than 2, high and so on. And then we want to compute our summary, um, descriptive summary statistics of um, all the variables here. I wouldn't say eight variables, all the variables with appropriate graphs and then perform some correlation matrix, uh, correlation um, um, analysis. Fine. So here, this package. Anytime you, you go online and you see this is the first thing that you saw in someone's blog, a blog that the person created, okay? The very moment you see these things, it implies there are packages you need to install first. So if you fail to install these ones, then, for instance, movement actually is used to compute skewness and ketosis, okay? If you, if you fail to um, 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 install that package, and load it, you will not be able to, uh, you get errors if you run my function because I am making use of that particular package to compute just the skewness and ketosis, okay? So keep that in mind, that anytime maybe you are doing, you want to do, let's say, fitting, let's say, um, um, let's say survival analysis in R, and then you go online, you type how to do survival analysis in R, and you saw some packages, the first thing you need to do is to load them, okay? And I told you that after installing a package with install.packages, you don't need it anymore, but anytime you want to run your function or you want to do the analysis, you have to load, okay? And you don't need internet when you are loading. You only need internet when you're installing. Fine. So here we know how to set a working directory. We set a working directory and then in Jupyter Notebook, in order for me to get a, a, a high, as in a, 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 a maximum plot, okay, or a big plot, and then I want to choose some specific um, resolution. I can actually choose a resolution of 100, but 300 is okay. I mean, the more you choose the re resolution, sometimes it gets too much. You know too much of everything is bad. So 300 is, is good enough for publications. Fine. Um, so there are instances you do analysis in other softwares. Their resolutions are super poor. And sometimes SPSS is one example. In R, you can set your own resolution and get that kind of quality you want. Fine. So here we've imported the data for MetaRead. Now, let me just... And then, yeah, we've imported the data called meta rate. You realize that there's a variable called income, but there's no variable called income level. And this is the variable that I want to recategorize. Okay, so here I'm just trying to look at the minimum of, and you see, I'm using a dollar sign with the income level. I could have typed only income like that only if I had attached the data. We've done that before. So now I'll get an error because it doesn't know income. Anytime you get an error, Check the error message. The error message will always give you a hint. Don't get error and call someone that um, I'm getting errors. Always check the error message. The error message says that object income cannot be found. So that is the error. So you just fix it. Okay, so keep in mind, always the error message should give you a hint. Um, I told you once you attach the data, you can actually use income as such. But I, had, I, told, I told you also about the problems associated with um, attaching data because Especially when you attach, you import several data sets with similar variable names. Sometimes you can get this cohesion, which can affect it. The software will find it difficult to decide or to determine which one you are asking, okay, which one you are calling for. Fine. So here I'm looking at the minimum and the maximum. So the max is just an inbuilt function to find the maximum in R. Fine. So here, this is the line of code that I'm using to do the rate categorization. So the, the new variable I want to add. I'm calling it income level. So I guess, so this is the original data. Then bringing a dollar sign and adding this new name automatically will add this new name to the data, okay? And then the cut function is what we use to decide if it is less than, let's say, so these are the threshold. I've set it in such a way that if it is actually less than 1.5, it should what? 
it should consider that as the first category, which is low. And then if it is between 1.5 and 2, it should consider it as medium. If it is between 2 to the maximum, the maximum, you realize that the maximum was 2.39. So I could just set the maximum with anything. So I just put three because the maximum was that. Okay, fine. Now here, keep in mind that you should be careful whether you are including the upper limit or you are including the lower limit. So if, I mean, in, my, in the example, I said it should be from 1.5 between, uh, from 1.5, but not include, uh, um, but 1.5 to two with two excluded. Okay, so in that case, the upper lim the upper limit which is so if i say the upper limit is more like the right side of the of the interval and the lower is the is the left side of the interval okay so so the at this stage the two is at the right side so here i'm saying that the right is false the right is false means that it will create an open interval at two open interval means that it's, it's not going to consider two as part of the interval okay so, so always be sure. If you wanted to include two as part of the interval, then you could just put maybe 2.1. In that case, it will, op it will create an open interval at 2.1, meaning that 2.1 will not be included, but two will be within the range. So keep that in mind. If it, you are creating from, then you need to add a little, uh, anything, it could be 0 0.05, anything you want to add, and that should do the job for you, fine. And then here I specify the names of the categories. Now, if I should run the data, you realize that it has added the new variable called income level, and then it gives you the specific categories. Fine, let's just go straight to the other task. So here, this is the summary function that I've been talking about all this while. So the first thing is that it determines the type of variable. Like I said, before you use my summary statistics function, you should have already indicated. So for instance, if I wanted to create a variable called income level, I should have already created that variable and now I have this category, okay? So suppose you have you um, this income here was, let's say, gender, and I coded it as one and two. I have to tell R that one is male, two is female before you use my summary statistics function. So keep in mind, before you use the summary statistics function, you should have already declared those that are uh, categorical, okay? So keep that in mind. Now, suppose you've already declared them and now you have your data in, in check. So my function, what it's going to do is that it determines the type of variable. If it is numeric, it computes the mean, median, mode, standard deviation, standard error. Standard error is just the standard deviation divided by the sample size, the skewness, ketosis, and even quantiles. And even record them to two decimal places for you. And also plot histogram of all the numeric variable with some unique color. Okay. And then if it is categorical, it finds the percentages, record them to one decimal place print out the names of those categories and then as well plot a pie chart for you and choose different colors for you fine so there is no for instance if i have a variable um, let's say i create a vector um, let's say two five eight let's say ten if i want to find the median i just have to type median of x and that is the inbuilt function but keep in mind that if i type mode of x it doesn't return the mode mode of s doesn't return the mode mean of x will return the mean and mean of s will return the mean standard deviation s sd will return the standard deviation var will return the variance okay now we i mean we already have our own functions to do the variance anyway but that's not my focus my focus is that mode does not return the actual the kind of mode you are looking for it rather it rather asks whether your variable is um, numeric or categorical okay so Keep that in mind. So suppose I had created, let's say, element, and then let's say, um, Ima. and then I should look at the mode. It says it's a character. So the mode is not returning what I really wanted. What I really wanted. Okay, fine. So let me just, and you know, you cannot find a variance of, of a string. So that's why I got the error in the first bit. Um, okay, fine. Up. all right let's let's go on fine so so that is that um so that so here so this is my complicated function i wouldn't because we don't have too much time i wouldn't be able to explain all the details but i've already talked about it extensively in my youtube videos almost because if you watch the first youtube video we started building this function from scratch we started with a small function and every youtube video was a complication so anytime 
I mean, diff different YouTube videos had different objectives that I wanted to achieve. But there was there was always one specific objective about complicating this match, making it so complicated as possible. Even this complication is not done. You can add extra complication. By the time you watch the first, let's say, four YouTube videos, you should be able to add extra complication, okay? And I've explained those things extensively. So now I've already told you what the function that I'm considering does, okay? So I wouldn't go much into it, but you can clearly see that it first of all, to the, it first of all ask whether it's numeric. Is dot numeric means that is it a numeric variable? If if true, then it should compute the mean, median, the skewness, quantas, and everything for you. And then this is where I'm doing the histogram plot. You know, hist 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 is used for histogram. And here um, I'm choosing um colors based on the variable index okay fine and and then yeah so here this is where i said so to return you realize that i'm returning the variable names i'm returning it as a list the variable names the summary measures the summary measures you realize that i created a data frame of all the summary measures and i'm returning that that data frame called summary measures and then i'm also um, 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 returning the histogram plot. So just imagine as, as a single function is first of all returning all these complications. And then it asks whether it's a factor. If it's a factor, it finds the percentages run to one decimal place. And then it's, um, it's actually, um, create a data frame of each, um, category. I mean, the name of the categories and their percentages. And then I've, I made it in such a way that it should run to one decimal place for you and it didn't paste the percentage sign. Okay, fine. I won't, and then here, this is where it chooses the different colors. So here I was saying that if the number of levels or categories are strictly two, then it should choose two colors from something we call a rainbow. So the rainbow is, a, is like a rainbow color. And in R, the rainbow has a lot of um, different colors. So if you specify N to be, let's say, 5, it will produce five unique or different rainbow colors. If we specify N to be 3, it will produce anything. Yeah. So previously, I set it to be red and blue, but I just wanted to just use the rainbow. So I set, I just use the rainbow. Um, you can change it. You can actually um, bullet this one and then open this one, and it will return anytime it's um, category, I mean, um, binomial, or in terms of is uh, dichotomous or with two variable uh, categories, it will just return the red and blue. And you let's stick to the previous one. Fine. All right. So now I've run this function though. So this function is a bit complicated. So this is where it becomes useful. So once you import or you load the packages, the packages that I told you to load, okay, all you need to do is, and now you've imported your own data. So you realize that when I was creating the, this data, I use a general name called data. But my actual data frame that I want to do the analysis is called meta rate. So you realize that I didn't use the meta rate as the argument. I use a different name so that it can be universal for any data you want to consider. Okay, so keep that in mind. The variable index here is, is actually the positions of each of the variables. Okay, so here, if I set, so here, all I needed to do is that in the, um, I, I specified the, the data name that I want to do the analysis on. So this is where you can use any of your data, the, any data that you have, you can, you can specify it here. But before then, make sure you've already declared those that are categorical, you've already declared that they are categorical. I will need just 10 minutes to wrap up. And so keep that in mind. So this, this is where you're, you specify your data. And this one, setting the variable index to be one means that I want to know the summary statistics for the first variable or the data at the first column. Okay, so keep in mind. So here, suppose I don't even know the name of the variable. Let me run this one. It tells me that the name of the variable is called rate. This is how beautiful my function is. It tells me the name of the variable is called rate. And then it gives me, since it's numeric, it computes all these things for me. And then it plots the histogram and it chooses this color for me. Now, if I set it to be, let's say, if I set the index to be three, okay, so I put it in such a way that you don't need to care about the variable. So three, I don't even know the, the position or the, which number is at the third position, okay, or which data is at the third position. Of course, if I want to know my variable names, I can just type names around my data. That will return all the names or the unique variables. So if it is third, definitely one, two, three is execution. 
So if I run this one, it tells me it's execution and execution is numeric. So it computes all these and it chooses a different color for me. Fine. So if I should put, let's say, five here, I also get something which is called income and then it returns and it chooses a different color. So that's the, that's the beauty about my, my function. Now, there was the eighth index is a categorical variable. If we check, the eighth index was actually, um, I don't even have to know that, care about the name. Let me just run the eighth index. Once I, it's called South, and I, I, I think that was the yes and no, whether you are in the South or not. And you realize that it, it returns the categories and it returns the unique percentages, and it gives me a nice pie chart. Okay, fine. So, so that's the beauty about my function. If I set here to be nine, um, okay, nine. So we realize that nine meant the variables does not exceed the data does not have more than more than eight variables or columns. Anyway, so I can put seven there. All right, seven tells me it's something numeric, and the name is called non cox whatever. Fine. Anyway, so let me just stick to the eight. Fine. Um, so that that is the beauty. So if it had several categories, you could have. So suppose it has 10 category, uh, categories it to compute all the percentages, the unique percentages for all the 10 categories and it will choose unique colors for all the 10 and, and also add like specify the name of the category, the percentage sign, the way you are seeing. OK, so try this one on your data set. Try it on any data set you have. And this will make your life easier. All right. So here to um, so I will finish in the next 10 minutes. So here to have created a function for you, which you can use. So you realize that it's a, I specify it. So when I'm creating all these functions, I'm using the same building blocks of creating the function. What I started earlier, I just wrote function. The argument is just the data. OK, so this function, what it's doing is that it picks any data and tells you all those variables that are quantitative. So I've created the, um, this function to determine all the quantitative variables or numeric variables of your data. So once you run this function here, I specify the data is metal rate. Once I run this one, it prints out all the um, 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 category, uh, sorry, all the numeric variables for me. And I've also created another one that returns. All these have already been done uh, in my YouTube video. So you shouldn't you shouldn't um, um, be worried. We don't have too much time, but you can always visit and, and, and learn and practice at your own pace. OK, fine. Oh, someone is writing on, on my. Um, all right, fine. So for for um, how do you call it for the categorical underscore variables, it returns all the categorical variables of your data. So and these functions, you can just copy and paste and use it. Use it for anything you are doing. OK, so what I'm doing is that it shouldn't only work for me. It should work for everyone. OK, so here you realize that I always use a general name for my argument. And then now I specify a particular um, data that I want to use. So if I run this one here, it told me there's only one categorical variable. That's why you realize that it was only one categorical variable that um, 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 I actually retained when I use the index eight. Um, if you watch the other YouTube video, I think I added two extra categorical variables. Okay, so so keep that in mind that um, if you watch the other YouTube video, I also um, the added extra um, two variables, um, categorical variables, which we created um, in in R. Fine. Now the next thing is, um, which is the last thing. This is actually the last thing is to do correlation matrix plus. Why do you need to do correlation matrix um, co um, correlation? Okay. So um, keep in mind that you can only do correlation mat matrix plot based on only quantitative variables. You cannot find a piercing correlation between two um, 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 categorical variables. If you want to find correlation between two categorical variables, like let's say one sex and let's say educational status, in that case, you can only do a chi-square. So the chi-square is the categorical version of trying to find correlation. Let me, let me just put it that way. But if you want to find correlation between two uh, numeric variables, you have to use um, what do you call it? You have to you have to um, um, make sure that you have to use the Pearson correlation. Or if you want the Pearson correlation is a parametric correlation test. Suppose you want to be ro robust about the assumptions of normality, you can use a, a Spearman correlation. You can use a Kendall Tau correlation, and this function can produce any type of um, um, co correlation that you want. So here I'm specifying Pearson. If I specify um, Kendall, it produces Kendall Tau. If I specify Spearman, it produces Spearman. But always keep in mind that the 
PSN is what you need to use for your, your, your studies, okay? Unless you are finding correlation between two, let's say, two discrete data. Suppose you have a data on number of road accidents and you have a data on, let's say, number of women who were involved in the accident and you wanted to find correlation. In that case, using the PSN, keep in mind the PSN is used for continuous data, okay? So if you find using the PSN for that instance, uh, um, statistically, the data is not normally distributed. So statistically, you get some output. Keep in mind, if you do anything, any wrong thing, you get an output. That is one thing you have to keep in mind in, in, in programming or st um, statistical analysis. Getting output does not necessarily imply you are doing the right thing. So always be sure what you are doing. If you are not sure, ask or just use the internet. The internet should always be your first point of contact. Fine. So this function is called chat.correlation. Correlation. It's actually produced from the performance analytic package. And it's actually the most powerful correlation matrix plot. Okay, let's see the beauty. So this is the kind of things you get. So it's kind of produced three things for you. So the first thing is that we have a variable call. And keep in mind, it's we are doing it based on only what the numeric variables. And that's why I created my own function called quantitative underscore variables. Once I once you use, you specify any data here, okay, and you specify the the, the actual the, the name of the data. So let's suppose our data was um, data underscore meta rate. And then here, I told you we use square brackets for extraction, isn't it? So here, what I did was that, and we know that the first part of this is the rows to extract rows, and this part is to extract columns, right? So the very moment I type, I bring quantitative underscore, underscore around the data, uh, underscore variables around the data, it actually returns all the numeric variables, and then it will extract those numeric variables for me using the square brackets. Fine, so that's what I did. Um, so here, um, so, so just to look at the interpretation, so, for instance, this one, the correlation between the variable rate and conviction. And um, let's say you want to interpret, let's say, um, this one. This is the correlation between rates. Look at where they intersect. Rates, where does this intersect? This intersect with income. Okay, it intersects with income. So, here, what it does is that the leading diagonal is actually histogram plots of all its histogram plots with some normal, um, with some normal curve or um, bell-shaped curve on them. And then the upper diagonal actually retains the correlation. So what type of correlation? You can indicate any type you want. I'm using PSN. And then it indicates whether the correlation is significant or not. Three, um, um, once you have an asterisk attached to any correlation, it implies it's significant. Three means that it's significant at 0.1%. Um, two means it's significant. Two star means that correlation was significant at um, 1% level of significance or alpha level if it's one size it was significant at 0.5 or five percent um, um alpha level fine so this is the, and then the lower diagonal actually plots the the scatter plots okay between the two variables so for instance this one is the scatter plot between the variable time and let's look at where it intersects it sorry time and it intersects with execution. So this is the scatter plot between execution and time. If you are fitting a regression, some keep in mind the regression model, you are using a linear regression model or either you are using a nonlinear. Suppose that there are nonlinear relationship between two variables and you are fitting a linear model. In that case, you, be, you, you, should, be, you should be ready that you are going to get a um, very bad estimate, okay? Because you are using a model that is predicting linear relationship between your dependent variable and independent, okay? So situations where, and this one helps you to determine whether we have linear relationship existing between any two variables or something nonlinear. If you look at this, for instance, time and income, they intersect here. So you can clearly see that there's a nonlinear relationship, specifically there's a, um, there's a, a curvy upward relationship um, um, between um, time as a variable and income. So you can clearly see this one is nonlinear. So suppose your time is an independent variable and income is dependent, and you wanted to predict income based on your time, and then you are using a linear regression. Keep in mind, you, you might, your estimates might not be significant or your results might not be realistic, okay? So in that case, there are so many ways you can go about it. I think I covered it in my eighth YouTube video. I explained that extensively. So you can actually fit splines to such data. By fitting splines means you're actually trying to 
and straighten out that non-linearity to make the data a bit linear. And then we use some class of models called GAM. GAM is like generalized um, additive models. And then you can use those things to fit uh, models where some of the variables don't have a linear relationship with the dependent. Um, so I wouldn't go into uh, much into that. Maybe tomorrow we'll try that. Tomorrow is the last session of the class, so we'll try, we'll try um, because tomorrow we are going to do fitting model. So yeah, we'll try that. Yeah. So this is the end of today's class. Uh, what we did was that we learned how to create our own functions and we said that there are instances where depending on the task you want to do, you might not be able to get an inbuilt function to implement what you wanted. So you should be able to create your own functions. When you are given any formula, creating your own function shouldn't be a problem. Just create a function the same way you are seeing the formula. He just created the same way you are seeing the formula, and then you you you'll be you'll be good to go. And at this stage, you can try more complicated um, um, examples online, and then try and get a formula, create a function uh, with it, and try and plot it. This will now help you to be able to those of you who are learning who are into math. We, we used to memorize curves and those kind of things. Let's say the shape of uh, square root of x, the shape of x squared, the shape of x cubed the shape of s exponent 4, and so on and so forth. You can actually check all these shapes by creating your own function and, and checking them. But those times, we have to memorize and pull. Just imagine, yeah. So this is this is uh, the beauty about um, programming. If you are good with your programming, learning articles or learn, seeing complicated functions in articles will not scare you. So if you get any article and you see a very complicated function, you don't really care. You can create your own functions to do that. So that is where you should be converging towards. So start with the basic things, build on it, and keep practicing. Programming, you have to be consistent if you want to be a good programmer. There's no easy way around it. There's no way you, you just sit um, for two hours or three hours and get everything. It actually takes a lot of practice. Okay, fine. So here we, we saw how to complicate that functions. And I also explained my, my summary statistics function, which I created. And I said, with that summary statistics function, the beauty is that it can you can use it to find summary statistics of any data, okay? But before you use that, you should have prepared your data already. You should have this and um, determine which ones are categorical, specifically the categorical ones. You should indicate those that are categorical, and then I have also created functions that will determine which variables are categorical for you after you've done that, and which ones are numeric for you. And then the function is such that. Um, it asks which type of variable. If it's numeric, it, it computes so many um, summary statistics with histogram plots with different colors. If it is categorical, the categories could be, let's say, 18 categories for that particular variable. It will compute the percentages for each of them, print out the names attached to the, the categories, I mean, uh, attached to the percentages, and also plot a, a nice pie chart with different colors for you. And then we also um, looked at um, um, correlation matrix plot. And we said there's a package called performance analytic package that can be used to obtain a very nice informative correlation matrix plot. If you are doing regression, you would might want to get such plots. Sometimes it gives you a fair idea whether some of your variables have a linear or nonlinear relationship with the dependent variables. OK, so so just keep in mind it's, it's very useful. And then it also tells you whether the correlations are significant or not. Fine. So yeah, so we'll end here. Um, don't forget everything will be uploaded on YouTube. Tomorrow will be a bit much complicated because tomorrow we are going to do we are going to start model fitting. We are going to fit some models, and then tomorrow will be the end of our four day um, seminar workshop. And it has been an honor um, 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 teaching you all. And I hope you practice. And don't forget that my YouTube channel is just to promote math mathematical programming among students. Okay, so keep in mind. Once you're able to get these skills, it improves your employability. Now, I mean, the companies, if you, want to, if you want to get a job in a company, every company works with a data. That is the secret. You can be an engineer. You can be a biologist. However, the fact that you're a biologist doesn't mean you should not be able to do the complicated statistical analysis that the statisticians do. If you're able to do that, it makes you, it gives you that, that kind of, that is what we mean by your value, okay? Because if you're able to do those things, it improves your employability. When you're now going to ask for, when you're going for job interviews, you don't go there to tell them what they want to, what they want to hear. You tell them what you can offer. And if you can do statistical analysis, meaning that you might be a biologist, but you can also be working under the statistical units. And now every company works with data. And if you're able to do programming in R, 
that alone can give you a job. So just keep in mind to take your programming very seriously and take and be consistent. Don't start today and then and then give a break. No, be consistent. Keep practicing. Keep practicing. Don't try to memorize your codes. With time, they'll be part of you. So I'll end here on this note and see you tomorrow. Take care. Bye.